Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you are joining us from today. Welcome to day two of the ADB's ninth International Skills Forum, Reimagining Education and Skills Development for a New Normal. So this is the first time we are conducting this event online. This is day two and participants who have attended yesterday's session on reimagination education probably enjoyed the first day very much. We had two keynote speeches by our ADB Vice President Bambang Susatono and His Excellency the Minister of Education of Indonesia. We had a super interesting panel on the future of education and we had four breakouts related to gender, agriculture, health and digital access. So today our focus will actually be on school education transformation. So for sure in COVID times, this is a topic that is on your mind. So what's coming up today? We're going to have two keynote addresses on the topic of reimagination education through adaptive learning, evidence and implications on scaling up quality and equity. That's our title. We have two major experts sharing their thoughts. And then we are going to have a panel discussion on transformational digital learning, some amazing experts assembled here by the ADB team. And after a short break, we're gonna have our first innovation marketplace focused on K-12, and you can choose one out of five sessions on innovations. So stay with us, we have a very interesting program ahead of us. So let's now get right into it and listen to our first keynote speaker. I have the pleasure to announce Professor Katik Mualidaran. He is a Tata Chancellor's Professor of Economics at the University of California, San Diego. His topic will be evidence-driven ed tech. So I hand over now to Professor Katik for the next 20 minutes. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to wherever you may be attending from. Uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to give this keynote address at the ninth uh, Skills Forum of the Asian Development Bank. Uh, I'm excited to be here and what I'm going to talk about today in the session on education technology is the importance of evidence uh, in making uh, effective policy in this very promising space of education technology. So um, I'm going to share a presentation, most of it is pictures but I'll get this across. Um, okay, um, yeah, so, so I'm gonna talk about evidence-driven education technology. I'm a professor at UCSD and also global chair of education for JPAL. Uh, you can follow my updates on research, et cetera, on Twitter. And so let's get started with the talk for today. So I think, you know, the reason we have this panel today is that everybody is excited about the promise of education technology. Um, there's enormous potential and this is, uh, in, you know, it's kind of obvious to most people, um, including scalable access to high quality instruction, supplemental instruction, practice and reinforcement at home, even when you're outside the classroom, um, that you could customize the learning path for students, um, induce greater engagement with gamification and speeding kind of responses to students, um, shortening the feedback loop for students, right? So often when you uh, do a paper and pencil assignment, by the time you get it graded and it comes back, you've kind of forgotten why you did what you did. And so getting the instant feedback as to what you did right and wrong um, is also going to, um, in principle, help learning. Um, and you could have gamification and rewards that I just talked about. It could support teacher training and skill upgrading, uh, which is another huge area of potential for ed tech. And the other kind of uh, thing which I'm very excited about is that historically in education policy, we mostly folk, I mean, so the paradox was this, right? The research showed that 80% of what happens in long-term education is determined by household factors. But as policymakers, we thought we could not intervene in the households. And so the focus was mainly in the schools, but what you're able to do now with mobile technology in particular, with text messages, with WhatsApp, is also start engaging with parents and parent groups. So you can see why there's so much excitement around different aspects of technology in education as a way of finally, you know, we've had this promise for a long time of disrupting education and 
That's kind of what all this excitement is about. Now, the bad news is that when you go look at the evidence and look at high quality studies on the impact of EdTech, uh, despite all of this promise, the evidence is quite mixed and often quite disappointing. So, you know, you have studies, high quality studies using either randomized control trials or very um, credible um, control um, treatment designs. And you basically, you find that the effects are all over the place. Okay, so there are studies that get you positive and modest positive effects. There are studies that get you large positive effects. There are many studies that get you zero effects, um, including very high profile interventions like one laptop per child where you spend a lot of money, give kids a bunch of computers and basically found no effect. Um, and then there's studies that get you negative effects. OK, so a, 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 a well-known study in Romania that gave uh, computers to middle school students basically found negative effects on learning outcomes because the kids were mainly playing games. OK, now, again, once I tell you that, that's kind of not surprising, but but it's really important to keep this in mind. And the, the whole goal of the session is to place evidence at the center of how we think about ed tech policy, um, because the, it's precisely because there's so much promise that it's easy to get carried away with the promise, whereas the evidence teaches us that we need to be a lot more nuanced and careful in terms of how you deliver and get the benefits of this technology. So, so what is going on and how do you make sense of all of these kind of effects that are all over the place? It's that the design details really matter a lot. Mm. And so, you know, the main question is not can you throw technology at a problem, but is it can you identify what the binding constraint is to quality education and can you use technology to alleviate those binding constraints as opposed to simply throwing technology at a problem. So what I think two decades of high quality research in education in developing countries shows is that the two most important binding constraints for education in low and middle income countries, it's not so much resources as much as its governance and pedagogy. Now, Technology can help alleviate both, but it requires careful design and monitoring. So, you know, one of the papers I want to talk about briefly is a paper that, uh, you know, a, a study that we did in India with the software called MindSpark that was published in 2019 in the American Economic Review. And this has been, I think, one of these really encouraging studies because we found large positive effects. But what I want to show you is not just the positive effects, but give you a sense of why these effects were so positive. So the study was done in Delhi. Uh, it was targeted at a group of middle school students from grade six to nine. And this was an after school ed tech program where kids came to a MindSpark lab or a center where they spent about 60 to 90 minutes working um, at the sessions, about half of it on the technology, about half of it in um, just getting supervised uh, homework support. Uh, but the most important fact you need to know about the context, and this is, uh, uh, again, these figures are from the paper, is the, the, the staggering gap between where students' learning levels are and where the curricular standards are. So, so this itself, by the way, is one of the benefits of education technology, which is using the technology for measurement, which is something that we otherwise wouldn't have understood if you were just using paper and pencil tests. And now, so what you have with the technology-based assessment is a dynamic assessment that can give kids easier or harder questions based on how they're doing. So what you see, if you focus on the left in the math graph, is that the kids in the study were enrolled between grade six and nine. And if they were in fact at a grade appropriate standard, they would have been on this 45 degree line. In practice, in grade six, they're about two to two and a half grade levels behind, which is the red line. And by the time you get to grade nine, they are the average grade nine kid is only at about a fourth grade standard or about four and a half. So about halfway behind or four grade levels behind the grade nine standard. And on top of this, what you see is that each dot in this picture is one kid. So it kind of highlights just how much variation there is in learning levels for students in the same grade, okay? So now this reflects in some ways one of the perverse and unintended consequences of a no detention policy because essentially advocates of this policy were concerned about school dropouts and wanted to keep kids in school regardless of their learning levels. But the the negative effect of that has been that by the time you get to grade eight or grade nine, you have kids in the same classroom whose learning levels are spanning all the way from grade two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And so it's almost humanly impossible for a teacher in these settings to cater to that kind of variation. OK, and I think this is what you need to understand so that you understand why the effects we found were so big. And that's because what the technology was doing was it was customizing the instruction to the levels of where exactly the students were. OK, and I'll show you a picture of that afterwards. But what you see is that the core result 
is we get you know dramatic positive effects in both math and Hindi. So at the baseline, this is randomized. It's a randomized controlled trial. So the baseline levels in the treatment and control are comparable. But at the within five months of the program, you see that there's more than a doubling of the math gains uh, and more than a tripling, uh, or you know about two and a half times uh, in in Hindi. Okay, now. What's even more interesting is that if you look at these levels, these gains by the initial level of learning of the students and break it down by the bottom third of students, the middle third and the top third. Now, the blue dots are showing you how much learning gain or value added there was in the control group. And the red line is showing you how much there was in the treatment. Okay, so the good news here is that you see that all students benefit because the, the red minus blue is positive and roughly the same for all terciles of student learning. Okay, so now, but what's even more interesting is that if you look at so the absolute gain, the absolute impact of the program was the same for all kids. Okay, but the relative impact of the students was the greatest for the weakest kids. And that's because the kids who were at the bottom third in the class were basically learning nothing from sitting in class because they were so far behind where the curriculum was being transacted that this gain in absolute terms is comparable. So the reason the absolute gains are the same across the board is because the system is custom Customizing instruction and teaching every student where they are, and therefore you see this gain in learning for all students. But the the students who were high performing were still learning at least something sitting in the regular classroom, whereas the students who were weak were learning nothing in the regular class because they were so far behind what was going on. Okay, so and so. So what's nice about this is it tells us not only that the technology can improve efficiency, but that it could presumably improve equity because the, the relative impact is the greatest for the weakest kids in the classroom. OK, um, and this is in the picture I promised you about what the system is doing in terms of customizing instruction. So um, the X axis is flipped from the previous picture. So now if you look at this grade eight classroom, so this is a snapshot on a single day of this program uh, in, in on the 3rd of November, 2015. And what you see on the X axis is that the kids are at grade two, three, four, five, six in, 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 in grade eight. Um, and so now the system is the Y axis here is telling you what is the level of difficulty the system is giving you. So if you're at grade two, it's giving you content at a grade two and three level. If you're at grade three, for some kids, it's giving you grade three. For some, it's reinforcing grade two. For some, it's kind of stretching them to grade four. But you see roughly that in the same classroom, you can see how there's no teacher who can simultaneously teach at a grade two, three, four, five, and six grade level. But that's what the system is allowing you to do. And that in turn explains why you see such large um, learning gains. And you see that basically almost every student student gains almost a full grade level within about four months of exposure to the program. So you see that the average grade nine kid started the program in November 1st below fifth grade level, but had reached close to sixth grade level within about five months. Okay, and the gains are kind of similar for and you can see that when you're enrolled in grade eight, the green line, the average student in grade eight is below a fourth grade level. And at the end of the program has now come to almost gain a full grade level in about three to four months of, of exposure. OK, so. And so that's kind of why I'm so excited about the potential of EdTech. And so this is, so after that study, we've now done a large scale scale up study of this in the state of Rajasthan, where we've been deploying this and studying it in government schools. Now we expect the effects to be lower because in the Delhi case, this was supplemental and adding instruction after school. Whereas in Rajasthan, we're now actually substituting instructional time and looking at how, whether this is gonna raise the productivity of learning. And those results, we've just gotten the data. So the results continue to look positive, though not as positive, which is unsurprising given that it's a substitution. But the main point I want to highlight again is this picture. And this is now from a much larger sample from Rajasthan. And I, per I personally consider this one of the most important pictures to understand developing country education. And you can see that now these are integrated schools from grade one to eight. And you see exactly that same pattern, that if the kids were making progress at the rate of the curriculum, they would be at this 45 degree line. In practice, the rate of progress is roughly half of what is envisaged in the syllabus. And this is particularly true for math, because math is cumulative and if you miss the early grade concepts it's kind of even harder um, to keep pace with what's going on okay so and the reason this picture is so important is it kind of tells us that 
the, it, it, it makes so clear this silent crisis of learning in developing country education. So the default approach to education policy in most global and national policy kind of documents is that we need to increase the budget, that we need to spend more, we need to build more schools, we need to hire more teachers, we need to raise their salaries. Now, these are not bad things, but the reason these things do not seem to have much impact on learning outcomes is that they're not alleviating the binding constraint to learning. And the binding constraint to learning is that students are so far behind that it doesn't matter if you build a new school or kind of pay a teacher more or even get a more qualified teacher, you're basically not connecting to the student because they're so far behind. And so, you know, one way to say this is, agar is lecture ke beech mein aapke samne Hindi mein bolne laga, to doesn't matter, to matlab koi farak nahi padta, mein jitna qualified hoon, PhD, uh, kya PhD hai mera, global expert hoon, feeling se padhata hoon, lekin koi fayda hai nahi, kyunki aapko kuch samaj mein nahi aane wala hai, kyunki aapki level jo hai, meri padhani ki level se bohat piche hai, right? And so that was just like a, a direct way to make you understand that the reality of kids in the typical public school in most developing countries is that you're basically lost because classroom instruction is so far ahead of you, okay? And that then highlights the potential of the technology provided we use it to suitably customize instruction. And I think, you know, this picture that I'm showing you in a way reflects the fact that many, many education systems, including in India, but also in many parts of East Asia, have historically focused more on selection and identifying who your top performers are and, and selecting. So what you built is really a filtration system rather than an education system, because you're trying to identify who is smart and then allocate them to scarce positions of higher education, as well as kind of the more um, lucrative uh, um, uh, careers and sectors they may be. So in some ways, more than technology, I would say the larger kind of fundamental mindset shift that is needed in developing country education systems is how do you move from a selection paradigm? So what we have today in most education systems is essentially a focus on the extreme top of identifying who is smart. But that, by definition, a ranking-based system, by definition, is zero-sum, right? Because only one person, if there's a fixed number of slots, only a certain number of kids can make it. But what we want to be doing as an education system is moving away from being a filtration system to being a developmental system that is improving learning levels at every part of the distribution. So it doesn't matter what your rank is. What matters is, do you know more today than you did yesterday? Okay, so can we make you better in a continuous way? And the reason I kind of highlight this in the context of technology is the real power of ed tech in my view, right? I mean, is now we have the ability to A, customize instruction so that every child is being taught at the right level. But more importantly, we also have the way of measuring and reinforcing and providing feedback to every child, every teacher, every parent about what absolute level of skills these children have actually learned. And rather than focus on your rank in a class or your percentage in some arbitrary test, you can focus much more on what do you actually know and make sure that instruction each day is kind of tailored to what you know and is scaffolded so that you're able to learn effectively. Okay. So in some ways, the technology allows us to come back to, you know, back in the day, education was the preserve of the elite and you had essentially private tutors. Now, the mass education was made possible by the structure of a classroom with grades and curricula and syllabi that, you know, allow you to teach a large number of children more cost effectively. But that comes at the cost of putting everybody in this age grade box, which the technology allows you to break out of if you manage to do it sensibly. Okay. Now, there's another big place where the technology can help, which is in governance, right? And now, um, and this is a very nice paper by uh, my co-author Abhijit Singh, and this is kind of looking at the challenge of administrative data integrity. And what he does is he looks at official test data. This is not even high, this is not a high stakes test. This is internal test data in 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 a large Indian state of Madhya Pradesh. And basically, what he finds is you know they have internally recorded student learning levels, and he randomly tests a bunch of these students on the same questions within two months of when that official test was done. And again, if the kids were actually at the same level, right? They you should see them on the forty five degree line. So the x-axis 
axis is the proportion correct on the official test. The y axis is the proportion correct on the retest, right? So if anything, you should see higher scores in the retest because this is done two months later. So the kids should have learned more in those two months. But in practice, what you see is that there's humongous inflation in the data, in the official school data, and the true learning level is less than half of what is reported. And in fact, most of the over-reporting happens for the weaker kids because the teachers don't want to show that the children haven't even mastered basic skills, okay? So here's then the case of the technology first allowing us to detect it. And then more importantly, what he does is does a randomized control trial where you're looking at digital tablet-based assessments. And what he finds is that when you do tablet-based assessments, the rate of data fudging like dramatically falls. So in the paper and pencil test, over 40% of schools are flagged for, for cheating. Uh, on the tablet, it's typically under 5%, okay? And that's because you have a question bank from which you can randomize which questions are are, are provided. And again, often this is not even the teachers cheating, right? The, the kids are often just copying from each other or, you know, there's a tradition that you just kind of look at the board and the answers are written there. But this way you're randomizing the questions that are asked. You're kind of real time collecting the data and grading it. And so that sharply reduces um, this problem of data fudging. And so this is an example of how the promise of technology for governance, right? For better measurement, for better visibility into what's going on in the classroom, for better visibility and student learning. And so if used well, the technology allows you to alleviate constraints about pedagogy and governance, okay? Now, the bad news is despite all of this, policy for the most part still focuses on input. So if you go look at the ed tech policy in most countries, the main focus will be on hardware and procurement and sanctioning the budget for computer labs, okay? So, and that's basically what the focus of the policy is. How much money do we sanction for setting up computer labs and buying computers? Maybe there'll be a budget for internet connectivity, okay? Now, software is an afterthought. Often there'll be an attempt to cobble together free resources and that's perfectly sensible. But the problem is that it is the integration of the pedagogy and the technology um, that will, including content curation, scaffolding of learning and monitoring of progress that will yield meaningful results. And, you know, from what I've seen in most countries that I, you know, where I observed the policy discourse is that there's simply not enough attention being paid to these issues right now. Okay. So, and some of these issues, you know, sometimes you'll, people will want to cover more schools and so they will reduce the hardware specs, um, but those that lower spec hardware may often be unable to run higher quality software. Um, Procurement is a huge challenge, right? So it's easy to procure hardware because the specs are standardized, but it's really hard to know when you have 50 different software vendors as to who in fact is an effective vendor in terms of the quality of their content, as opposed to just nice bells and whistles um, that, you know, it's really hard to know what's in fact effective. Um, you would need typically a project management unit to monitor the implementation and drive performance, including monitoring actual usage at the student level, right? I mean, and student learning gain which I think will be key to delivering the potential. Um, and, you know, the, there is no substitute for continuous impact evaluation and measurement of impact. So um, a recent RCT done by a PhD student of mine, Andy DeBarros, who uh, gra just graduated from Harvard um, recently, you know, looked at a very high profile um, ed tech intervention in India that was, you know, very well designed on paper. And it was the smart board project that was adopted by a state government deployed in a lot of schools. But what the RCT shows is that this basically had no impact. And again, my conjecture is part of what was going on was that the, even though you had the smart board and the technology is that the content was still kind of tied to the grade level standards as opposed to being customized, which may have sharply limited what the impacts would have been. And, you know, and, and, and a different kind of, uh, of, of, of issues in terms of um, thinking about uh, evaluation is just the alignment of goals and monitoring down the chain based on learning outcomes. So, you know, from an example of a computer lab in the state of Rajasthan, where I went there, you saw that there was this budget, this computer lab was built, it had six to eight computers, but the lab was locked and the principal basically had the key. And in practice, that lab was being used for only about two periods in a whole week. Um, and that's because the principal principal's single, single biggest concern is that the computer should not get broken or stolen, because if it's broken or stolen, then he's going to be held accountable and get into trouble. But nobody's holding him accountable for lack of usage or lack of any impact on learning outcomes. Okay, so if you want to convert your investments in hardware and technology into learning outcomes, you also need to align the goals all the way down the ed education system and be able to monitor the usage and the learning to make sure that this delivers to full potential. Okay. 
So the summary here is that there's huge potential for EdTech um, to improve both governance and pedagogy, as well as parent, teacher, and student engagement. Uh, but it's going to require enormous amount of attention to the details. The political incentives point towards providing inputs because everybody wants to kind of have their pictures on laptops and distribute them. We've seen this in multiple states in India. Now, fortunately, you need the hardware to be able to do the technology. So the hardware per se is not bad, but what the evidence shows is that the hardware is clearly necessary, but not sufficient, okay? Um, and so then the other big kind of concern I have which, you know, which is really worth reflecting in this time of COVID, is there is a very real risk of growing inequality due to ed tech, right? So the market rewards innovations that are able to kind of cater to the needs of those who can pay, right? So even the MindSpark technology that we evaluated that had these large positive effects, for the most part, was in a, that innovation was done for the top 10% of the Indian market, or maybe the top 5%, because that's the segment that can afford to pay, okay? Now, the study we did was using philanthropic funding to deploy the technology to low-income communities, but at scale, like, you know, this is still, the, the newer technologies are still disproportionately being deployed to those who can pay. And similarly, the COVID-19 school shutdowns have almost certainly increased inequality, um, given that, you know, um, there's this very nice study by Jishnu Das and co-authors in Pakistan looking at the earthquake in 2005. And what they found was that even four to five months of school, clo school closures had long-term negative effects on, on children whose parents were not educated. Now, if you had an educated mother, right, I mean, then you were able to catch up. But if you didn't have educated parents, then that loss of learning was almost permanent. And so, you know, and so to the extent that the policymaking class has responded to COVID in many cases by shutting down schools, that's kind of perhaps reflecting a, you know, a cognitive dissonance, right? Because their own kids have, have access to technology and have educated parents and are probably doing fine. But I think the school closures have been disastrous uh, for uh, low-income students um, who don't have access to technology or any other option for learning. Okay, And so I think while the promise of EdTech is real, there's also a real risk of growing inequality. And so it's essential for policy and philanthropy to focus on effectively accelerating the access to innovations to those who cannot pay. But again, it's not enough to just focus devices or inputs. Um, there's huge potential to use technology to alleviate the binding constraints of measurement, pedagogy, and governance, as well as student motivation and shifting to a focus on absolute versus relative learning. Okay, so I continue to be very bullish and very optimistic about the potential of EdTech uh, to really transform education in developing countries, but it's going to require enormous attention to the details and keeping attention, you know, paying attention to these issues of inequality and access in particular. So um, thank you. And, you you know, I wish you all a very productive and meaningful and fruitful rest of the conference. Thank you so much, Professor Katik, for your information packed presentation. And I personally enjoyed very much the study on Delhi and, and Rajasthan and the interesting conclusions. I'm sure many of you would like to maybe see this presentation again. So I just wanted to highlight that if you go to our website and you go to the agenda, you should find, for example, for day one, the, uh, the live stream of yesterday and also tomorrow, you can probably look for all the live stream of day two. So uh, if you want to see the main live stream again, you can do that. And I don't want to take much more time. I go straight into our second keynote speaker. She is a project director for EdTech at the Central Square Foundation. The Central Square Foundation is a nonprofit organization working with the vision of ensuring quality school education for all children in India. So we stay somehow uh, still in India to, uh, with our presentations. And she will share her thoughts about reimagination education through technology and ecosystem lens. So please welcome Ms. Gauri Gupta. Gauri, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Jost. Hello, everyone. It is indeed my honor and privilege to be here today speaking with all of you and discussing a topic that is often fraught with controversy as well as excitement. Thank you, ADB, for the opportunity to be a part of this summit. Next slide, please. To introduce the Central Square Foundation, we have been working towards ensuring quality education for all children in India since 2012. Our mission is to help transform the school education system and improve the learning outcomes of children from low-income communities. 
Our work is focused on two impact areas, foundational learning and education technology. We believe that foundational learning or the development of reading comprehension and math skills by grade three is most critical to improve learning outcomes for all children. Next slide, please. Education technology. Can we move to the next slide, please? Education technology, more commonly referred to as edtech, has demonstrated the potential to help combat the learning crisis by augmenting traditional learning practices. Technology supports and empowers teachers, engages and provides agency to students, and meaningfully involves parents and families in the teaching learning process. Technology can also collect data to provide valuable insights into how students learn. Emerging global evidence has shown that edtech can support learning in a big way, here in Asia and across the world. Catalytic growth, disruption, innovation are afoot in the sector, riding now on the wave of increased awareness and demand due to the pandemic. Next slide, please. In one of our latest reports, Reimagining Education Through Technology, we studied over 350 edtech innovations across the globe that leverage cutting edge technologies to create deeply immersive and engaging learning experiences, as well as those that seem to be surpassing resource constraints to cater to the needs of students and teachers. These innovations were categorized into nine teaching learning interactions across three key stakeholders, teachers, students, and parents, as you see on the right of the slide. We further analyze these interactions and innovations to gain insight into how edtech has impacted traditional teaching learning practices such as lesson delivery and self-learning, and highlighted the potential of technology to disrupt nascent interactions like homework and doubt resolution. For teachers, EdTech has begun to reduce the burden to deliver quality lessons. For students, tech has made them increasingly independent in their learning process and created pathways for personalized and engaging experiences, both in as well as outside the classroom. While for parents, as their role becomes even more pertinent amidst the disruptions to traditional school models, tech has facilitated their participation in the child's learning process. We found that innovation is pervasive across contexts, from semi urban India to remote parts of rural Tanzania to the burgeoning cities of China to Silicon Valley and a scale to reach millions of learners, teachers, and parents across the globe. Emerging global evidence that Karthik spoke about of its efficacy and the onslaught of the pandemic has spurred considerable growth in the sector and innovation continues to brew as we move towards the new novel. And as we continue to learn more about the integration of edtech, we remain cautiously optimistic that innovation will help in reaching students to the last mile and truly supporting teachers and parents as learning agents. Next slide, please. However, the two oft-discussed challenges continue to plague the sector, and particularly in the developing world, access to devices and lack of internet connectivity in remote and rural areas. It will be imperative to build on the momentum for edtech post the pandemic and innovate to continuously solve for these constraints. Analysis shed, sheds light on how the edtech ecosystem globally has evolved to address these challenges in interesting and innovative ways. First, I want to highlight the potential to increasingly personalize learning, even over low-tech devices, where users only require access to a basic feature phone that will allow them to send and receive text messages. This is in point is on the left-hand side of the slide, where Anisa Education, an edtech organization based out of Kenya, has developed a platform that allows students to access contextualized and affordable academic content over SMS. Interesting examples emerge to show that technology can be leveraged even when the internet is not available. Many organizations are making their offerings available offline, bringing high quality educational content to remote and rural communities and ensuring quality of access. Notable example for this emerged from India. Google's read along and app based solution can operate seamlessly without the internet when a variety of stories are downloaded at the time of install and remain available for access even when the device is not connected to the internet. A speech recognition powered in-app reading tutor listens to the learner as they read aloud, offers support through nudges in the lear learner's native language when they struggle and rewards them when they do well, all on the learner's local device. Next slide. To meaningfully leverage this innovation, 
it is important to consider how it can be implemented. Meaningful adoption and effective implementation of EdTech is complex and multiple facets need to be considered. Over the next few minutes, I will focus on the four things that I think are invaluable to the process of meaningful adoption of EdTech that governments either ignore or struggle with. Next slide. The first is about choosing the right use case of EdTech. The second about the big question around learning software, because we all know that learning software is what can make or break an EdTech program. The third is around the stakeholders that need to be onboarded to implement EdTech effectively. And finally, the kind of policy environment that is required to enable adoption by the ecosystem. Next slide, please. So let's talk about choosing the right innovation. Multiple use cases of EdTech exist today, with solutions catering to different parts of the teaching learning process. Given this diversity, it becomes imperative to decide what would be the most meaningful technology to procure. A few factors are at play here. First, an assessment of the needs of the system. Understanding the context that you're working with and the challenges that you're seeking to address is imperative to understand the right fit for EdTech. For example, in the Indian context, one of the largest gaps that has been identified is that there is a huge diversity in learning levels and students generally are many grade levels behind. Professor Karthik also alluded to it, uh, this in his presentation. To plug for this gap, one would want high quality remediation solutions that students could engage with to come up to grade level without teachers having to remediate individual students. The second factor to consider is whether there is evidence of the efficacy of the solution to plug the identified gap. So going back to the example, since this gap identified in India was a need for effective remediation, one may decide to adopt personalized adaptive learning or PAL solution given significant global evidence on the impact of PAL for the purposes of remediation. In short, it becomes critical to identify the challenges in the specific context and then look at the evidence for where technology has been able to solve for these challenges. Next slide, please. Now, given what we know about the diversity of innovations that exist, we come to the second consideration on how do we pick the right solution from what's available. One of the key challenges is the information asymmetry around the quality of solutions. There exist hundreds of EdTech products for the K-12 audience, and there is an enormous variety in terms of the product intended goals, target audience, the technology used, features available, cost, etc. When it comes to selecting EdTech solutions, there remain ambiguity on what solutions are good and fit for context and purpose. Consequently, most EdTech adoption decisions are based on marketing by the product or are just ad hoc. In such a scenario, st stakeholders such as schools, parents, governments, investors feel the need for a systematic quality evaluation to make informed adoption decisions. An example of a solution that has been uh, developed to, for this issue is EdTech Tulna. This framework is being designed using rigorous research principles and global best practices and will include elements like content quality, pedagogy, design, and user learning experience. The aim is twofold. One, to create the standards and tools that can be used to evaluate edtech solutions, and two, to make the evaluations of existing edtech solutions against the Tulna framework publicly available. We hope that by integrating frameworks like Tulna, procurement processes can become more objective and scientific, leading to better learning outcomes for our children. Next slide, please. Now coming to the third consideration around implementation. Parents engagement in the learning activities of their children is one of the most effective ways to increase child educational outcomes. However, cognitive and resource constraints faced by parents could limit their ability to effectively engage with their children's learning activities. These constraints may affect how parents value educational investment in their children and also day-to-day -day decisions about homework, assignments, test preparation for their own children. This is particularly true for disadvantaged households. Recently, technology-based interventions have evolved that aim to improve the quality and quantity of time spent by parents with children in learning activities. There is room to fund and innovate towards building parental capacity to meaningfully contribute and engage in the child's academic and social-emotional learning. Teachers, we all know, are the peg around whom learning, evolve, uh, learning revolves. This also extends to edtech, 
where effectively incorporating and integrating technology in classroom instruction is contingent on the teacher. Qualitative studies suggest that teachers faced a host of barriers in implementing technology in the classroom and that the teacher learning and professional development are fundamental to effective integration of technology in teaching. COVID-19 induced school closures and move to online learning have brought to fore the importance of tech preparedness for teachers. Continuous research and innovation in both parental engagement and teacher professional development can be catalytic in preparing these stakeholders for the new normal. Next slide, please. Finally, we come to the last pillar, creating a favorable policy environment for continued innovation and sustainable long-term adoption of edtech. In order to do so, governments need to have a clear vision and focus on how technology can be integrated into education. One key step may involve the setting up of a dedicated institution with a clear mandate to integrate technology into teaching and learning to improve student learning outcomes. Such an institution can function as a platform for the free exchange of ideas on the use of technology to enhance learning, assessment, planning, and administration. South Korea, an early adopter, set up the Korea Education and Research Information Service, KERIS, in 1999 and saw strong growth in the meaningful use of technology for education. Recently, the government of India, through the National Education Policy of 2020, has called for the creation of the National Education Technology Forum, or NETF, an apex organization for edtech in the country. Other policy measures can also be impactful. For example, the US edtech policy lays emphasis on continuous capacity building of educators. Programs like Teach to Lead provide a platform for teacher-led leaders and allies across the country to create and expand ideas. The policy encourages shared responsibility of teachers and school leaders for the success of edtech programs, given, giving teachers the independence to evaluate these programs that are best suited for their needs. Such focus and policy measures can greatly enhance the way in which a country perceives the role of that technology can play in education. Next slide, please. In conclusion, we remain optimistic that technology has the power to democratize education. The tailwinds are strong, the intent is strong, and the journey has only just begun. As Einstein famously said, if you do, if you always do what you always did, you will always get what you always got. It may be try, time to try different things. Thank you so much.